acknowledge the Almighty who is present here with us, acknowledge the indigenous people of this country and the thousands who have come after to make this beautiful land home. I acknowledge the land on which we are here and the traditional owners. I acknowledge the Prime Minister of Fiji and the Forum Chair, Presidents, Prime Ministers, Ministers, Special Envoys, members of the di Diplomatic Corps, ladies and gentlemen, and all those people at home. It gives me great pleasure to invite the Honourable Josiah Boringe Bainimarama, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Fiji, and the Chair of the Pacific Islands Forum, to, to please, I invite you, sir, to deliver your opening remarks for this evening's Pacific Talanoa Leadership and Re Regionalism. Leaders of the Blue Pacific, Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, distinguished guests, and members of our panel. Bulavinaka. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to welcome you here this afternoon to share ideas and stories on an issue that is vital to our shared future and to my, and of course dear to my heart the specific leadership and regionalism. Thank you all for taking the time to join us for the final uh, installment of our public Talano series with forum, forum leaders. The rich discussions that have taken place over the past three days have given us as leaders much to consider when we convene for our retreat tomorrow. We gather at an extraordinary time in history. For one, it is quite moving to look out into the audience and see faces from our regional family and international community after two long years apart. I have uh, envisaged this week for quite some time, having registered Fiji's uh, desire to host the Pacific Islands Forum back in 2019. And I'm proud that the time has finally come. At the same time, however, we cannot ignore the state of our world today. Let's uh, be frank. It is up against some very significant challenges. At the turn of the new decade, Pacific leaders have declared a three-pronged crisis in this region. We were deeply concerned by the direct and indirect impacts of COVID-19, the devastating effects of climate change, and ensuring, uh, ensuring uh, uh, natural disasters. Then, of course, the rising prices of commodities that exploit our inherent economic vulnerabilities. Once again, we in the Pacific find ourselves confronted with a high, unaffordable pride, price of self-serving diseases made beyond our purview. The enduring nature and normalization of global crisis is deeply concerning to us. They are not normal, and we must push back on any narrative that accepts this uh, reality. Our region relies on a stable international environment if we are to achieve the aspirations we share for our people. Adding another layer of complexity to the regional climate we find ourselves at the center of heightened geopolitical and strategic interest in our region. Although this is not new to us, its uh, intensification over the past 12 months is significant. While we welcome the considerable opportunities that come with greater interest, we must also be prepared to engage with the challenges that follow. 
the global context in which we find ourselves, so very different from the world of our predecessors, calls for a fundamental rethinking of the way in which we work together as a region and the way we engage with, its, uh, with partners. As uh, stewards of an increasingly threatened and contested Pacific Ocean, the onus is on us as citizens of the Pacific to safeguard our future in our blue corner of the world. You will be aware that forum leaders are shortly going to begin in-depth considerations around the 2050 strategy for the blue Pacific continent. As I said earlier this week, I believe the strategy will serve as our North Star for the decades to come, providing us with a long-term vision, key values to guide our way and a sense of our shared trajectory as we voyage into the future. The 2050 strategy will guide us in our engagement with the world from a position of a collective strength and foresight. It will ensure that we work together as the blue Pacific continent to manage our shared challenges and leverage our opportunities and strengths to secure our long-term future. And as I've also said, Strong political leadership is critical for effective regionalism. It is important that we as leaders remain committed to our citizens, as well as actively seek opportunities to invest in dialogue and consensus building at the regional level. The two are not mutually exclusive. As leaders of today, we need to be an example of the change we want to see. In addition to being a national citizen, we are also called to be Pacific citizens. And I am confident that uh, if strong leadership sets a course, Pacific regionalism will sail swiftly forward, buoyed by a unified Pacific Forum. We are at a critical juncture where deeper political will and strong leadership is needed to drive the type of regionalism required to achieve the 2050 strategy and ultimately realize the vision of our past, the present, and future Pacific leaders. I very much look forward to hearing the political journeys of our panelists this evening and the leadership qualities they hold dear. I also look forward to hearing the perspectives of our youth and future leaders who will inherit inherit this important work in the years ahead. What uh, do tomorrow's leaders need now from our region, uh, political thinkers, regional institutions and leaders? Ladies and gentlemen, as I bring my short remarks to a close, I must reaffirm that this is no ordinary forum. In 30 years, I am optimist, uh, optimistic that we will look back at this time as one of Pacific regionalism watershed moments. But to achieve that, we must work together. None of, this, none of us can uh, do this alone, and thankfully, we are not alone. Minak Walewin, good evening to you all. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, for those inspiring words. We now come to the part that we've all been gathered here, which is the important panelists. So it's my honor to call up to the stage our moderator, Dr. Audrey Amour, who's from Fiji, but lost to Samoa by way of a marriage to a Samoan, and married in Samoa with two boys, one of which plays top rugby. And she is the CEO of the Fred Hollows Foundation in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Dr. Audrey Amour, thank you. Our first panelist is the Right Honourable Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Prime Minister Ardern comes from a long line of women Prime Ministers in New Zealand. And she continues to carry the torch for our people in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Please welcome to the stage Prime Minister Ardern.
Our next panelist is the Honourable Fia May, Naomi Mataafa, the Prime Minister of the Independent State of Samoa. The Prime Minister is a, comes from the long lineage of the royalty and the nobility of Samoa. Her father was himself a Prime Minister of Samoa. So we are indeed privileged and honoured to have her with us today. Our other panellist is the Honourable Simon Coffey, Minister for Justice and Communications and Foreign Affairs of Tuvalu. Notwithstanding that Simon and I were both at law school together and much younger than me, but I now call him Sir. So it is with those brief opening remarks I hand it over to our moderator. Oh, Wait five, we have our final panelist, His Excellency David Panuelo, the President of the Federated States of Micronesia, to join us. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> President Panuelo has served the distinguished service in private and public service, and he comes with us with a lot of knowledge to share about of experiences in the Federated States of Micronesia. Thank you very much. Audrey, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Afaleti. Um, Bolivinaka, everyone. And uh, Afaleti, thank you very much for making the, the kind introductions and observing protocols. Uh, for this, our last Talanoa in a, a series of Talanoa here at the Civic Centre. And uh, my thanks also to the Prime Minister of Fiji um, and Forum Chair, who uh, has started uh, uh, and set the scene for tonight's Talanoa, and I thank him very much for his introductory remarks. Let me also uh, welcome and acknowledge uh, the generosity of our leaders that are here tonight, uh, who have joined us for this, this Talanoa, and, um, and to share uh, their reflections on their own personal journeys as regional leaders. We feel pretty lucky this week. Um, a lot of the dialogue with leaders uh, has been a lot about the celebration of physically being back together again and sharing some of those stories and recounting those COVID moments. So uh, once again, we, we are grateful for that opportunity to, to be sitting together. This really is uh, an important time. Our leaders are about to sit uh, and talk about uh, the 2050 strategy uh, and set some goals and some vision. And uh, I guess this Talanoa on regionalism and leadership adds value to uh, the many discussions that are happening this week here in Suva on, on the 2050. Let me just um, also uh, recognize the moment and the celebration today. For the second time in our history, we have two women leaders in the Forum family. And both of them are here. Um, and and I should acknowledge um, and offer up the apologies of Prime Minister Songavari, who is unable to be with us today. Um, he's possibly one of the few leaders we've had that have been to more forum meetings than, than most, so we will miss his, his contribution. And to all of you friends in the, the audience and uh, those of you here in person and those online, it's not often we can have a public event uh, in which we can be part of such a discussion. And I really want to just acknowledge the government of Fiji and the Pacific Islands Forum Secretary for creating this, this opportunity to allow this, this particular Talanoa to happen. I, um, we, tomorrow our leaders go into their 51st retreat and so no doubt some of the uh, discussion that happens tonight will add, will add to that uh, flavor on, on regionalism and leadership. Many of you know the concept of Talanoa. It's uh, in the Pacific, you know, we know it by many different languages and so forth, but the purpose today is really to uh, invite our leaders to share with us their personal and relationship or relational encounters 
uh, what their perspectives are, how they view their own journeys as leaders in the region, but more so an important opportunity, I think, to share with us not only their talk story, but their reflections uh, about their own realities, their own re uh, journeys, and of course their aspirations. A chance not only to speak freely, but also to take these precious opportunities as leaders to build and grow connections with each other. I have um, a couple of reflective questions which I will give to the leaders, um, and then I will invite you, the audience, to um, join in this Talanoor with, with questions that you may have on regionalism and, of course, on leadership. <coughs> so if I may begin, um, our special guest, uh, Kasalila President Panuelu, great to see you and thank you for being here. If I can start with you, um, you've had a very long and distinguished career as a regional and international diplomat. Um, engaging both in multilateral regionalism and in sub-regionalism. <coughs> the Federated States of Micronesia has chaired the forum uh, and hosted forum leaders three times since you joined in, in the late 1980s. I wonder if you could reflect uh, on a couple of key moments uh, that have influenced and shaped and nurtured your own personal leadership journey and not only as a regional leader, but uh, also as a sub-regional leader. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Hartree. Uh, before I say a few words, uh, let me uh, join you and join uh, panel colleague leaders who are here. My deep respects to our dear Prime Minister of uh, New Zealand, Jacinda, good to see you again. Foreign Minister of uh, Tuvalu, uh, who is representing his country here today. And uh, dear friend, uh, Prime Minister of uh, Samoa, uh, Fiamme, you are here. And also thank uh, Fiji as the host uh, government and chair of the Pacific Islands Forum. Audience who are here. Uh, Micronesia is a, a little bit new in the audience because we don't uh, come to Fiji as often as other uh, regions who are closer. But we do have uh, students, maybe 50 plus students who are going to school here. And so thanks to Fiji for being a gracious host uh, here. But uh, we thank you for this uh, opportunity to uh, uh, speak on topics that are important uh, to our region. It's in fact uh, a great pleasure to be here to meet in person after three years of uh, a sort of absence uh, from our last uh, Pacific Islands Forum, which was held in uh, Tuvalu. I'm not sure what to begin with, Audrey. Uh, thank you as a moderator. But just to uh, maybe say a few words of opening, uh, our country as a constitutional government started uh, just by way of background in 1979 when we adopted our constitution. And I would place myself as probably being in uh, eighth grade in primary school, just so we put context to uh, you know, my uh, career. Not that I was uh, paying attention to politics about that time. And then if I fast track our country in 1986, uh, we emerge out of the trust territory uh, status uh, and then signed a treaty with the United States, which is now called the Compact of Reassociation. It's probably the only treaty that exists in the world uh, because it is unique. Our country, the citizens that travel into the United States are visa free. We do not need to. Uh, require visa to come in to pursue education, to work and live in the United States. And I would place myself at that time as being in a university in the United States in 1986 when I watched uh, President Reagan and our ambassador to the United States uh, sign that treaty which began a five year uh, term of the treaty with the United States. And we renewed that treaty in 2003 20 years, which is going to expire in 2023. And today, 
our country is negotiating that currently with the expiring provisions, and so we have a delegation that's in Washington, uh, San Francisco, uh, working with the U.S. to extend the economic provisions of that treaty uh, before next year. And so, as a, a student uh, college graduate around 1987, I went into the Foreign Service uh, career diplomat and uh, was a diplomat uh, for uh, uh, quite a few years until I uh, ran for a public office in our Congress of Micronesia in 2011 and uh, made it as uh, one of the two-year elected uh, representatives. And then four years or so down the road, I ran for political office again and became uh, the, what is called the hot large representative in Congress. Our Congress is comprised of uh, uh, 14 members. And uh, so uh, that's in a snapshot how uh, I went into uh, uh, politics as a student. I was uh, studying political science and got interested in international affairs. Uh, so I, I want to just uh, pick out those two dates uh, and uh, uh, talk about it a little bit because those were the uh, points in time that I believe uh, I got interested in uh, uh, politics and to represent our country. And so I was a member of Congress and uh, to fast track the story in 2019 as uh, one of the members of Congress I uh, was elected as the ninth president of the Federated uh, States of Micronesia. But my career as a diplomat, I served here in this beautiful country of uh, Fiji at our embassy for four years from, I believe it was 1989 to uh, 1993. Part of that embassy being established in Fiji uh, was a, a foreign policy uh, to be integrated with the Pacific Island countries here uh, as a newly emerging independent uh, nation. And then I served uh, for four years at our mission to the United Nations. Uh, and so I want to pick out uh, a point that the United Nations were the Pacific Island countries uh, where I would say a sense of regionalism uh, started for me uh, when we Panded together under the alliance of uh, uh, small island states to uh, uh, take, I believe, France to the International Court of Justice for the uh, nuclear tests that were happening in Mururua. And so the sense of regionalism for me in my earlier career as a diplomat uh, sort of started with that effort because under the banner of the Biodiversity Convention, we use that foundation of the Convention on uh, Biodiversity uh, as a basis to stop the uh, nuclear testing by the French uh, government because when uh, something happens in one territory or one country, uh, pollution doesn't respect the borders. And so the basis of the Biodiversity Convention, we were successful in stopping the uh, the test that was ongoing in our Pacific shared Pacific region. And so I'm trying to fast track my experience uh, coming uh, forward. And uh, so today here as a Pacific family gathering here at the 51st uh, Pacific Island uh, Forum leaders, it is refreshing to be among my colleague leaders here to uh, uh, look at the issues that are important to our uh, shared region. And tomorrow, as Audrey has uh, put it, uh, the leaders will uh, uh, discuss and, and uh, uh, endorse what our officials has uh, been recommending to uh, leaders uh, to, to make decisions on tomorrow at the Forum Leaders Retreat. And it's going to uh, deal with uh, issues on, first of all, uh, climate change, which is our uh, existential security threat for all of the Pacific Island countries uh, here. We have the 2050 uh, uh, Pacific strategy for our blue Pacific continent and uh, other security issues that we'd be discussing 
uh, in the next uh, day uh, to uh, make these decisions on behalf of our uh, Pacific shared uh, Pacific uh, communities. So our three, I, I'd say, put it Thank in you. a snapshot uh, of uh, a fascinating my journey, career uh, journey, <laughs> and I'll share more of the more contemporary. Uh, I think you. our decisions that uh, I was able to make or uh, continue to make mm. on behalf of our country, whether it is a national issue, mm. regional, and uh, down. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency. And as you were describing those moments um, that drew you to, to leadership, <clears throat> I, can, I can well imagine what the excitement was. And, and I guess the question, if I may, just as, as a follow-up, you talked about the compact agreement, you talked about the work of what was going on in the Northern Pacific at the time uh, around the nuclear testing and so forth. Those are the moments that drew you to, to politics. Has it also shaped how you feel about regionalism in particular, those, those moments? Well, uh, those moments were the earlier uh, influences that I felt truly as part of the region to work together in uh, uh, international advocacy for what is important for our uh, shared uh, Pacific region. Uh, the more uh, uh, closer contemporary experiences and uh, hard decisions that uh, as a leader I had to make uh, since I became a president uh, uh, from 2019, I think one was a, a very difficult one because the United States uh, has been a very close uh, ally of the Federated States of Micronesia under the relationship uh, through the compact of reassociation. And when January 6th happened uh, uh, with the uh, insurrection uh, at the uh, capital of the United States, uh, it was one of the difficult decisions for me to uh, uh, condemn the former president, or at the time, the president of the United States, but uh, it wasn't that individual that I was condemning, but, uh, uh, or it was that individual, but not the government uh, that I was condemning, because uh, as a, a government uh, growing up, I think democracy is one of the uh, most important uh, values that we need to protect, and even though uh, it's a high-level individual, uh, uh, I wrote a, a letter uh, to the American people and to the government to condemn the action of uh, President Trump uh, because uh, democracy is something that the world must uh, fight for and truly preserve uh, so that uh, uh, the world can be a, a better place for uh, all of us who uh, uh, continue to advocate for rule of law, uh, democracy, and the values that are important for our global community. Thank you, and, and thank you for, for, for emphasizing that. There's no doubt in the audience there are probably a few people that may want to ask you a few questions uh, about your activism life. Um, but thank you, Kalingam President, really, for those reflections. If I may now turn to you, Prime Minister Ardern, Tenakoi. Uh, great to see you, uh, and good afternoon. And, uh, you, you know, New Zealand hosted the first meeting of the forum back in 1971. Um, and now I think this is probably your fifth forum leaders meeting, maybe the third face-to-face. Face-to-face. Face, face, face face face. I do remember when you came to Nauru yes. and the president sang to you. Do you remember that? Oh, yes, I remember. Yes. He serenaded <laughs> you, actually. <Yes. laughs> um, but would you, you know, um, We'd really love to hear your story um, and to reflect on those moments in your, your leadership journey, what's shaped your, your view of leadership, and, um, and what have been those moments? What have been those, those aha moments that, uh, that, that have shaped your, your leadership life? So thank you. Thank you. And with such an open question, uh, I'm going to spare you. Well, kia ora koutou katoa, na mihi nui kia koutou. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. When a moderator says, tell us your political journey and you've been involved in politics uh, since you were 17, buckle in, um, because it could be a long answer. But I'm going to give you some, I'll give you some uh, hopefully relevant highlights. You know, but as I was listening to you speak, it, it made me realise, uh, again, it just reinforced for me the connection between uh, between us as leaders because of the connection between us as a region. And I, I fundamentally believe that the world would be a better place 
if we all had a much greater appreciation of how interconnected we are and the knock-on effect of one nation's decisions on another. And I do believe that the Pacific has a much more visceral experience of that than many other regions in the world. And as you were speaking, I was harking back on the fact that so many of my generation's experiences with foreign policy have been shaped by world events that have affected our region. New Zealand is a proudly nuclear-free nation. And I remember milestones within, as a very small child, because this is the early 1980s, uh, those milestones in our history where we, where we proudly stood up and said, not, not, in our, not in our neighborhood, not in our backyard, and we've been proudly nuclear-free ever since. And that will impact on a whole generation's psyche and New Zealanders themselves. You know, if you fast forward to the 1990s, uh, there'll be many of my generation who remember learning uh, that one of the reasons that you would burn to a crisp in New Zealand if you spent 15 minutes outside in the summer without sunscreen is because we lost our ozone layer, because the world was using chlorofluorocarbons, and that was causing New Zealand to be affected by the environmental choices of others. I think when you're a small island nation, which New Zealand considers itself to be, uh, when you are uh, feeling the consequences of the decisions of others, you appreciate your connection to one another. And that really feeds into the way that we see foreign policy and foreign politics, our sense of obligation to one another. But also, we, in considering those issues, we anchor ourselves first and foremost in the Pacific. It, the Pacific is where we are, but it's also who we are. Uh, and it's part of our identity as a nation as well. How does that then reflect on my um, personal journey in politics? Well, it's probably shaped some of the more significant leadership decisions of my time. When I think about the impact that the COVID pandemic has had on all of us, that has been, it's been a really hard time to be a leader because we've faced these devastating and difficult questions, often with imperfect information. Now, one of my reflections, which is slightly separate to the question of regionalism, but one of my reflections is I believe that we should be much more willing as leaders to speak openly about when we're making decisions with imperfect information. We don't know everything, but we're having to make a call nonetheless and share those experiences openly because it enables us to move collectively if our communities understand the basis on which we're making these decisions and why. And it can build that, that collectivism and that approach where we all are willing to move together because we can see the process our leaders have gone through in making those decisions. But my other reflection is just from a regional perspective. I remember uh, when we were thinking about the big decision of closing our borders. And that was huge for New Zealand, as it is any of the Pacific nations who have such a, a strong tourism industry in which it really is the foundation for um, many in our region's economy. And in making that call, I also thought about the fact that New Zealand considers itself a gateway to the Pacific. And that if COVID, at a time when we were without vaccines, became rampant in our country, and we were still hubbing to the Pacific, there was every chance it could become rampant in our region. And just that really weighed on my mind as well, because we have a history of seeing uh, for instance, the movement of influenza, uh, or, or as it was called by then, the Spanish flu, through our region, uh, in part, hubbed out of New Zealand. And many nations paid the price for that. So thinking collectively about the responsibility we have to one another in a pandemic, that for me reinforced the importance of uh, that Pacific regionalism and the way we think about these challenges. If I may share one final reflection, this is not at all linked to the Pacific, but I'm hoping there might be out there some people who may be in the beginning of their leadership journey or even partway through. One of the most defining experiences that I had as a young person was a moment when someone I deeply respected, who happened to be a history teacher of mine, uh, was talking about their journey as a teacher, and this person was profoundly influential on me. They were an incredible teacher, and to this day, I consider to be one of the reasons I'm in the role I'm in now. And he described to me the confidence issues that he had standing in front of a classroom, and it was the first description I ever had of imposter syndrome. 
This idea that at any moment someone may question whether or not you really deserve to be there doing what you're doing. Now, this is a huge assumption, but I'm going to make it. I believe women and uh, young women in particular experience it more often than perhaps our counterparts. But to this day, I've come across very few leaders or those who I respect who haven't at some point experienced a gap in their own confidence. We just don't talk about it enough. And I think by talking about it, we'll see more, in particular, young women who might realize that those people who they think have at all times all the confidence in the world, every single one of them will at some point have doubted themselves. And I hope in talking about that, you see that there is a place for you too. You do not have to have that, that self-assurance that is absolutely unbreakable to be in a leadership position. It is human to have doubt. And in fact, you're a better leader if you question your decisions on a regular basis because it allows you to make better ones next time. So that was just one little personal reflection on leadership thank I wanted you. to share. No, thank you. And I think... We, <coughs> I, yeah. I think there are probably many young women leaders out there <coughs> who will appreciate um, your frankness and, and in sharing that story. I, 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 um, I also want to just recognize and acknowledge the, the, the human heart aspect of that decision that you made around closing borders and, and your recognition of the implications that that would have on this region. I, I, I wanted to follow up, if I may, Prime Minister, when you think about regionalism um, in this region, and, and in particular how the role of New Zealand, for instance, is there something within that that you consider of the role New Zealand could play in nurturing regionalism? I mean, you, you've described the, the, the heart connection between that decision you just made and you knew what it would do for the region. Uh, but is there something else, um, you know, in particular, the, uh, the role of New Zealand in, in nurturing and supporting regionalism more broadly? This is a space where New Zealand is con constantly checking itself, <laughs> if I for want of a better word. Because, as I say, we're walking this, this, in this dual space where, on the one hand, we consider ourselves to be both in and of the Pacific. You know, when I think about how that's reflected in our communities and in our society, you know, roughly 9% of our parliamentarians consider themselves to be Pacifica. Uh, within my cabinet, um, you know, we had until recently uh, representation from the Cook Islands, Samoan, Tongan, Tokelau, uh, and you see that across our, across our parliament. Uh, it's Pacifica, those who identify as Pacifica, roughly 9% roughly of our population. At the same time, uh, New Zealand uh, is constantly working to make sure that we are a partner in the region. Very, very easy, I think, when you reflect back on our history to find times when we have not acted necessarily in that, in that way, when it's been too heavily weighted towards this donor donee relationship. That is, not, that is not the future of our New Zealand's relationship in the region. And so we, we, I think, continue to have work to do to make sure that as a member of the Pacific and anchored within it, that we build our partnership. That is the approach that we take, and we'll only do that through uh, genuine Talanoa dialogue, respectful relationships, understanding the priorities of our region, aligning ourselves with those priorities, um, and, and just walking the talk. But as I say, our history is not perfect. We, we have to make sure that we're constantly checking in with uh, our partners in the region that we are conducting in ourselves in the way that um, really reflects uh, uh, true, uh, a true Pacific uh, style relationship. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you. That was only the first question. Um, <clears throat> um, may I now turn to Minister Kofi Talofa? Um, and thank you very much for being here this afternoon. <clears throat> You're attending your first um, forum. leaders' forum meeting as, uh, as the head of the delegation. Um, would you share with us, uh, I'm going to be a little bit more direct here, um, some of your own reflections, obviously, on Pacific regionalism, and, and I know you have some very uh, deep views about it, but in particular, I wanted you to kind of share with us um, your experience in and working to preserve your country, um, Tuvalu, the territorial sovereignty of your nation, um, 
and in particular how you think the forum family can support you uh, in, in that regard. So these are really critical efforts by the government of Tuvalu. So thank you, Minister Coffey. Thank you. Some, thank you, Audrey. Some reflections. Um, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I just want to say it's a, such an honor to, to share the, the floor with this uh, distinguished leaders from the Pacific. Uh, I know I'm the, the new kid on the block, so I'm listening and, and learning from, uh, from our leaders here. So um, firstly, the, just talking on, on regionalism, uh, I think this is an issue that we've been considering uh, for some time now. And uh, as we all know, we have the, the 2050 strategy uh, uh, that we've uh, prepared and looking to launch uh, tomorrow by the leaders. And I think it's important when, when looking at regionalism, it's, it's important to, to understand the context uh, that we find ourselves in. What is the, the, the global context? And what is the, global emerg the emerging global context right now? Uh, because I, I believe when we talk regionalism, you have to begin with the, the context uh, and then begin to, to prepare your, your strategies and your plan to, uh, in response to, to the context. And, and I feel as... Um, as, as the Pacific, because we were very strong on culture, uh, we're predominantly a community-based society back in Tuvalu. Uh, and so many of our values and principles that we live by are very much focused on the well-being of the community. Uh, we, we emphasize the, the, the order and the well-being of, of everyone. And so if you look at the, many of the, the, the systems that we have, for example, our, our land tenure system, uh, land is owned by a community, by, by family units. And I, and I belong to a number of uh, land-owning units back home. And in order for, for those types of systems to thrive, you need to put the interest of the collective. The collective interest has to be uh, of, of paramount importance to, uh, to the people in, in that unit. And, and so I, I believe that we're in a very good place to, to look at how culture is relevant to dealing with the, the current uh, global context that we, we, we find ourselves in. Uh, if you look at what is happening now with um, you know, the war in Ukraine, uh, COVID-19, uh, climate change, these are global issues that affect everyone. And if you look at the, the global context right now, we've, for, for decades or for centuries, we've been building connections, um, improving trade, uh, integrating our economies. And we've reached a level where we are now vulnerable to, to each other's actions. Because actions you take in one part of the world affects even a very remote country like, like Tuvalu. And, and so I feel it's, it's important now because of the global context. If this is the global context that we find ourselves in, then we need to change our values, our principles, our strategies to, to achieve the well-being of all nations. And this is where I, I find the, the uniqueness of, of the Pacific because that's already part of our culture. And so what we share to the, to the world uh, are things that are, are very common to us. And, and so I, I see that there is such value that we have in, in our culture. Uh, and, uh, and I know we talk a lot about preserving it, but it's, it's not just about preserving. It's about bringing those and, and actually progressing it and putting that into policies and, and helping influence uh, uh, other countries. And, and one of the reasons I'm, I'm quite strong on, on culture is... Um, Growing up, I, I moved around the region a lot because my father worked in uh, different regional organizations. So I attended about five different schools in, in about four different countries. Uh, and, and culture was, my heart was always to, to go back home and, and to reconnect with, with my people and, and the culture. Uh, but one of the advantages that I had, although I lived outside of Tuvalu, I had my uh, grandparents uh, living with me. And so uh, I believe that many of the things they, they taught me about the culture uh, resonated really uh, well with me, and um, it's something that drew me to go back to uh, Tuvalu. To, to and, and so that's why I'm, I'm always pushing for, for culture in, in many of our policies and also in the, the process of formulating the, the 2050 uh, strategy. But uh, coming to your, to your question on the, um, the state, statehood issue, uh, as you know that under international law uh, right now, the, the, there's a, what you call the Montevideo Convention that has a criteria for, for what is a state. Uh, and there are four uh, in there provided in the, in the, in the convention. Uh, a, a state must have a, a land territory, a physical land territory. It must have a population. It must have a, uh, an effective government. And it must have the capacity to enter into relations with, uh, with other countries. Uh, and so if you, if you were to use that definition 
and apply it to, to Tuvalu in 50 to 100 years, because scientists are saying that we could be gone in 50 to 100 years because of, of sea level rise, then we lose that, that, that uh, out of one of those uh, criteria of, of statehood. And so Tuvalu has, has launched a Future Now project, which actually represents our plan for a worst case scenario. And so when we're talking about 2050, we, we actually have to be preparing for that scenario where many of the countries like Tuvalu will, may not be around in the next 50 to 200 years. And so what we're looking at right now is to looking at legal avenues where we can secure our statehood regardless of the impact of climate change. Uh, and that's a, a, it's a future looking, but it's, it's a reality for, for Tuvalu. I know it's difficult at times for, I guess, for the bigger countries and, that don't see the, the actual uh, impacts of, of climate change, like sea level rise, but uh, part of our advocacy is to, is to get that message out and to bring awareness to, to the world that these, these are real issues that we, we are dealing with. And so how we are going about that, we, um, we're signing bilateral, uh, we're signing joint communiques we, uh, on a bilateral level uh, because in our foreign policy, we're insisting that uh, any country that wants to establish ties with Tuvalu, they must recognize that our statehood is permanent and also our claims to our uh, maritime zones. Uh, and so we have about uh, six countries, six, seven countries now that we've, we've signed up on. Uh, and it's, we signed with New Way and Vanuatu, so a uh, special shout out to those two, two countries that accepted our, our invitation to, to sign the joint communique. And I hope that I can sign also with my friends up here on the, on the stage. That. <laughs> but that's, that's really the, the approach. <laughs> Thank you. No, uh, fantastic. <clears throat> Oh, kia ora, Minister Mahuta. I didn't, didn't see you there. Kia ora. Thank you, Minister Coffey. I mean, it's such an interesting concept, isn't it? And, and it's one that we are thinking about much more seriously, given the nature of climate change, uh, and given that we are talking this week about what the future does look like. So um, good luck to, to those signatures. I hope you, you canvass a few more leaders while you're here to get that done. But I also wanted to <laughs> just make the point of your youthfulness and this new generation of leadership that's emerging. And um, there is, um, you know, there's an excitement about um, this generation of leadership that, that's emerging. And so as you campaign and canvass these new ideas, I think, you know, those in the audience will, will, will deeply align and appreciate that kind of thinking. So I thank you. Thank you very much. Um, may I now turn to, um, so Fafatai, Minister, thank you. May I now talk, turn to you, Prime Minister Matafa, um, and um, what a privilege it is to have you here on our stage this afternoon. You have served Samoa and this region, uh, I think, for probably more than 30 years. I was trying to recount the, the age of my eldest son, who was born just before you were, you were um, elected. <laughs> um, and you really do have an incredibly long and rich history with the Pacific, and of course with regionalism. And I think over the last sort of 30 years, you've probably seen this concept evolve <laughs> in many different forms and shapes. Um, and now you are attending your first forum meeting as the leader of your nation. So I, my question to you is really, um, you know, what has been your observations, first as a leader, uh, as you've journeyed through over the past 30 years, and what have been those moments for you in leadership that really have shaped who you are today? And I was most in intrigued also to hear maybe a little bit about your, your views on how regionalism has evolved over this time, given... Um, You've probably got some, some long perspective around it. So a, a few questions in there, uh, Prime Minister. I, I, um, but I'll, I'll leave it to you to share what you may Oh, thank well, you. thank you very much, uh, Dr. Omua, for referencing my longevity. <laughs> I feel there's a divide on this uh, stage. You know, the youth on this side and... I would have to say that I am greatly encouraged, and I'm not being patronizing or ageist in saying this to you, Prime Minister Dern and Minister Kofi. But, you know, as someone has been referenced by Audrey, who's been around for, more, for a while, I'm greatly encouraged 
uh, to hear your sharing today and your vision uh, for the region. Um, I'd, at the outset, I'd like to say it, I am a strong advocate for regionalism. You know, not because it's an ideology or, you know, it's, uh, it's a strategic thing to do, but because it's, as um, Minister Kofi has said, it's about who we are. You know, we come from countries and societies that are communal. We are brought up on the concept of the collective and how we look to the greater good and the welfare of those, you know, that we live with. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not some fancy strategy. It's because of who we are. And I think, you know, we need to remind ourselves um, that it's because of that that we talk about regionalism. Um, you know, quite often the discourse, you know, either being communally based or whether we should be more individualistic. You know, we talk about human rights and human rights are targeted towards the individual. But I don't think they're exclusive. You know, the development of the individual strengthens the, com the community and the collective, at least for us here in the Pacific. So I think, you know, it's, it, it's very important that we remind ourselves of that. So you're asking me, uh, Audrey, about my leadership uh, journey. So it's premised on that. So, you know, I'm a Samoan Matai talking more about the particular leadership steps that has led me to sitting here on this stage and attending this uh, leaders forum. I became a Matai when I was 20 uh, because my father died when I was 18. Um, and you know, the families, uh, as they do, um, were deciding who the leadership should pass on to. We couldn't agree by consensus. So now we have arbitration uh, courts. Um, and I became a Matai uh, very early. So, you know, it's a chiefly system. But quite often there are misconceptions about chiefs. You know, it's more often colored through the lens of privilege. But once again, I think it's very important that we articulate and explain, you know, in, in the case of the Samoan context, the Samoan Matai is, you know, a trustee of the extended family, representing the family at village, district, and at national level. But you go into being a Matai premised on your resp responsibilities to to the collective. Now, so being a Matai, next step, uh, being a member of parliament, next step, you know, getting into cabinet, next step, deputy prime minister, resigning from being deputy prime minister, <laughs> and then, you know, uh, coming into to the leadership after our general elections last year. I want to say that as an incoming administration, we have an opportunity really, and especially post-COVID, um, I think this is a, 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 an opportunity for us to review um, and reframe you know, how we live, how we operate, and also reimagine, because we're talking about 2050. Um, a lot is being said that, especially with COVID, uh, you know, there's so many uncertainties. But that's where imagination comes in. Um, you know, are we imagining ourselves in a different way, especially post-COVID, uh, from where we were before? 
earlier today, I'd, I'd made an intervention, Audrey, at uh, the earlier uh, dialogues. You know, we, people talk about, uh, especially, uh, you know, with multilateralism, the rule of law, and we all agree about that. They are a set of rules that have been set. We've signed on to them, but how much have we really contributed to how that is interpreted and filtered through to the way we, we live our lives? Um, so I don't know about uh, colleagues sitting up here, but I'm finding this period a period of, you know, real reflection. Have we been doing the right thing? You know, um, it's almost so, sort of like we've gone along to get along. Um, and where have we found ourselves? Are we satisfied, you know, with that? Um, we talk a lot about, I mean, we talk, yesterday we talked about people-centered approaches and designing our development strategies and uh, programs focused on that. You know, and nobody asked the obvious question. I was sitting over there and I was really hoping I could ans ask the question. So if we haven't been people-centered, what have we been doing? You know, is it rhetoric that, you know, we've been sort of floating along? Now, it's often been said, and I think it's fair comment for us in the Pacific, that in terms of international relations, you know, people ask, oh, what's your foreign policy on this? And we've said, you know, friends to everyone, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality of it is we spend our time navigating. How do we, you know, navigate our way through, through the larger, more powerful countries, the people that set the rules, and we've sort of agreed to it and gone along to get along? At what point or at what level can we truly say that we are in control of our lives? I mean, Simon has said, we're also interconnected. But there is, I think, a level where we can say, as a country, as a community, this is what we are, this is what we are, this is what we are responsible for, you know. We talk about the Blue Pacific, and when we talk about the narratives about the region and, you know, regionalism, the collective and so forth, in the early days, we talked about the Pacific way. What was the Pacific way? An approach, a way to, to build a relationship, looking around ourselves, you know, and th it was also the early days of countries coming into independence. Further down the road, we're talking about the Blue Pacific, and that discourse, in the way that I see it, it's about us putting a stamp and saying, this is our turf, we're custodians of this, we're responsible um, for for this, this is our home, our livelihoods, um, and you know, building our development aspirations from a custodian um, perspective. So, I just want to to finish off by sort of a more personal thing. You've asked, you know, what what have been key key points or key days. I I can't. I can't really do that because if, you know, it would suggest that you're really thinking a lot about yourself, you know, and also I'm at an age now, I can't think back that far <laughs> ago, but, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, what formed my ideas about regionalism, what formed my ideas about leadership? Well, like all of us, it started on, you know, the laps of your parents, the laps of your grandparents what they were telling you, what they were, they were doing. So 
for me, you know, and the, our, um, um, I was introduced as, you know, coming from a family that's been in politics, and that's true. My father was the first prime minister of, of my country, so I knew about him going off, you know, having meetings with other leaders uh, from the region. So I knew that. I had a mother who was very active in uh, women's organizations, in church organizations, the National Council of Churches. Um, she was involved with the USP, you know, one of the best uh, illustrations of uh, regionalism. So I knew about that in terms of what my parents were doing. But for myself, leader, my leadership um, was greatly enhanced by my association uh, with youth organizations, not only in Samoa, but in the region, with women's organizations, and also with the churches. So in, even before you know, I got my title and went into politics, that was where I got you know, personally involved um, with the issues of the day. You know, as a young person, as a young woman, um, and as people of faith, as most of our um, of our region are. So, um, and the other thing I think that was quite influential in terms of you know, broader Simon talked about going to five different schools in four countries or more. Well, I went to school in New Zealand. Um, and that, and when you live in another country, that's a great influence on you. You know, so I, I saw, you know, and, and New Zealand is, is quite different from most of us in, 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 in the Pacific Islands. You know, uh, like Australia, you know, this was a settled country, but they have an indigenous population. But more than that, you know, the relationship that we have especially with the Polynesian grouping, with, with, the, with the Maori community. So, you know, it introduced those other facets uh, of the relationship and of the region. The, the last thing I want to say, um, Audrey, is that um, leadership. And I appreciated what Prime Minister Dern was talking about, how being open um, about when there are uncertainties, but having to make the call because you're in that position. That's what you know, people like us do. You make the call and you, know, you take the credit, but you also take the other stuff, right? Um, and she talked about the gaps of confidence. I'm gonna go further. You know, males, they're so confident. You know, they promote themselves, you know, they, even when they're not well qualified, they can talk it up and get job. You know, women. <laughs> women are a bit more timid, you know, and there's always a talk around the women's circles, and, you know, all my women colleagues here will know. You have to be twice as good, three times as good, four times as good, you know, before you're, you're recognized. But I think, once again, it's about going really deep. We can talk about gender inequalities, you know, and, 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 and we have such a bad rep in the Pacific, right? That, you know, women aren't well represented in, in, in our houses of parliament. But we have a situation now where girls are doing so much better at school than boys. And yet, where do, our, where do we find our, our girls? You know, the, 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 the equations aren't sort of uh, coming through. So I think, as a region, we really have to dig deep, you know, and go back to our cultural basis um, and the values that we have because I don't think it's a fair reflection on our societies, you know, that we're, uh, that we're um, what's the word? 
we don't respect women, you know, we don't care for our, our youth. Why are, we letting it, why are we letting this happen? Have we, have we lost our values? You know, are we following someone else's story and not our own? So, I, and I think we, you know, people talk about change. I think for us in the Pacific, we need to do a lot of reclaiming. We need to reclaim where, where we come from, what our values are, and how we've been taught from the laps of our parents. So last year, we had an unusual phenomena in my country politically. Right? We had an administration who had been there in 40 years, and I was part of that. Um, we had an, an election, and we turned it around. And every single visitor with political interest who would come to Samoa or who, who we've met even here at this meeting have said to me, how on earth did that happen? Well, I can tell you, you know, the, we took it to the people. The Samoan diaspora helped us out. But I will have to say this to you. And, you know, this is the Pacific. And we uphold our Christian faith. So I have had to come to this conclusion that it wasn't any grand plan of mine that got me to where we are, where I am now. It needed another level of intervention. And, you know, I want to make that public declaration. Uh, it was a spiritual intervention. It carried a wave that no one could really explain rationally. Um, and all along the way, people have said to me, you, you look so calm. Well, I was calm most of the time. <laughs> but because, essentially, one, I had faith in what my ancestors had come to an agreement on. Our constitution that set up a sovereign government, premised and upheld by custom and tradition, but also our Christian beliefs. I believed in that. Because for a country to come to an agreement like a constitution is not an easy, easy process. And I felt compelled in my time and in my generation that I had to go back to what those people had committed to each other, that this is how we were going to establish a country and the basis that it was premised on. The rule of law, the upholding of principles of custom and tradition, and especially our Christian faith. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Um, and you've allowed us to to enter that knowledge space and to hear firsthand what that was like for you. And no doubt there are many young women out there who uh, will have learnt a little bit about you know, confidence and uh, how one takes control of their own destiny. Um, but thank you for sharing that really uh, honest story. I, I'm really, I had a whole lot more questions to ask, to ask these leaders. Um, but I'm really conscious that, that it means less time for you, our audience. So if you will just allow me to ask one more question of them, and they can all give us one minute uh, of response, and then I will come to you, because I can feel the, the, uh, the anxiety of people wanting to get enough time to talk. Um, I, one, one final question, uh, and it's the same question for all of you, if I may. <clears throat> Recently, a senior Pacific leader said that regionalism <clears throat> has no full stop meaning it's not something that we get to and then stop and say we've got there. 
it's a journey of constancy and devolution. And I, I wanted to ask you all this. Um, what is it that you think that leaders in the future are going to have to navigate personally and politically to achieve the ambitions that we have started to talk about in Suva today? <clears throat> if I might invite you, Prime Minister Arjun, to start, and then we'll, we'll start with the younger side of the, the, the panel, and then we'll, we'll move to the, the older generators, as they say. <clears throat> Thank you. It's so fascinating that you're putting me in that category. In New Zealand, <laughs> I'm, I'm quite old. <laughs> Polit political years. I think our youngest politician now is 26, I think, in the New Zealand Parliament. I think that's something to be proud of, though. Our parliaments should have the diversity to reflect the, the public that they serve. They should be full of both uh, those who are, represent the aspirations of our next generation alongside the wisdom of those who have the experience of, of, of life and mistakes made uh, by politicians many times over, that we are the richer for that. I hope that the panel reflects that a little bit it's today. Your youthfulness. But I think we're actually probably missing one extra generation, because I know you were wanting to know this. I just asked Simon how old he was. <laughs> I'm that rude. And I have to say, we're not that far off in age, but my goodness, you look two decades younger than me. So, <laughs> um, what do I think, what do I think politicians will navigate in the future? I remember when I first came in as a, as, a, as a Prime Minister, some officials from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet sat down with me and went through this thing called the Risk Register. It's basically everything that you should prepare a nation for just in case it may happen over a 20 to 50 to 100 year period. When I think about that list that they went through, everything from biosecurity issues to global pandemics, to natural disasters, to domestic terrorism. To think that you could experience almost all of those things in a five-year period, I wouldn't wish it on any leader. And yet, here we are, in many cases, having experienced the difficulty of these in short spaces of time. So I can't predict what future prime ministers may experience. But as a region, my hope is that we first and foremost anchor ourselves and one of the journeys that New Zealand continues to go through is that uh, we are a, a nation that is uh, continuing on its own journey in making sure that we anchor ourselves as, as a place within the Pacific where our relationship between the Crown and Māori, we are continuing to demonstrate that the, the treaty on which you know, our founding document is a as a nation between those, between the Crown and Māori, that we are continuing to live that and demonstrate that in everything that we, that we do. We've just, just now embarking on a place where all our young people learn our history. We're embedding it in our schools, and learning our history means learning, of course, locally, about uh, everything from uh, the land wars in New Zealand, the relationship between Māori and the Crown and how that has evolved over time, Te Tiriti, uh, our ongoing recognition of Te Tiriti and everything we do, but the role of Pacific and the journey of Pacifica peoples in New Zealand from everything that means the good, the bad, the ugly, migration, dawn raids, everything. Learning our history helps us anchor ourselves, make us better connected to who we are and our place in the world, and is part of how we ensure that we don't repeat the mistakes of old. Learning our culture, our history, our language. We have an ambition that in New Zealand, uh, a million New Zealanders will be able to converse in Te Reo Māori by 2040. So I hope that first and foremost, we anchor ourselves in place, in culture, in history, because that will then help us anchor ourselves in the region, and it will help us make decisions that better understand our history and our place. And I think as long as we have some of those fundamental values in play and we look out to the region and that regionalism, I just hope no matter what comes our way, we'll be better placed to tackle it. And we'll know that in tackling, tackling those challenges, we are not alone. If I may just reflect very quickly, and then I'll stop, on something that um, Prime Minister Fiamme said, uh, but I think actually, we talk about finding confidence in ourselves as leaders. How do we find that same confidence in ourselves as a region? 
we talk a lot about how contested our region is. Uh, and there's often that mantra of friends to everyone. I hope we tack on to that family first. That we look to each other in those challenging times, but we have confidence in ourselves as individual nations, but as a region, to tackle our own issues, have confidence that our values actually are going to carry us through, and those specific values are lean in on them because they'll serve us well, and they are unique in the world, but they're going to help us get through some gnarly times. Be willing to stick our elbows out and say, family first, and the way that we do things matters, and we should be willing, willing to look to each other to tackle some of those really challenging times. Those are my reflections. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Minister Coffey, I might come to you next. Any thoughts on um, you know, what leadership might need to deal with in the next uh, 30 years or so? Yeah, thank you, Audrey. Um, I think if you were to ask... Sorry for outing your age. That <laughs> that's fine. That, that, that was really, I hope you take it as a compliment, my friend. Thank you, I, I do. I take it as a compliment. <laughs> but, the Pacific, uh, they forgive everything. <laughs> <laughs> So it, 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 nuclear testing, we've still hung on to that one, and rightly so. <laughs> right. Um, I have to gather my thoughts now. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> just trying to get a bit of banter going. <laughs> so I was just saying that um, if you were to ask me three years ago that a pandemic was going to stop the world in its track, uh, no one would have predicted that. But here we are. Uh, I mean, if you, if you look back, Five, uh, five, 10, 15 years, the world has really changed, and, and quite quickly as well. And so I think it's, it's um, very difficult to predict what is coming ahead. I think things might get worse, but what is the next crisis that's going to hit the, the, the world? Um, there's a lot of uncertainties uh, around that. But I think what is important is the, the values and the principles that has held us together for all this time the time-tested values that we have seen hold our communities in, in our own various countries uh, for centuries. Because I, I know that things are changing, uh, we're, getting become, we're becoming more modern, uh, but it's important that we never lose track of, of those values and the, those principles that have uh, kept us together. Uh, and it comes back again to the, the point I raised about the, the importance of starting from the wider and then looking at what is then our responsibility to achieving that. Uh, because in, in Back home in our community, the, we emphasize responsibilities. Everything is about your responsibility to your, to your partner, to your children, to your family, and to the, to the wider group. And, and that is the key to, to holding everything together, is when uh, every individual is, 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 uh, is responsible. So if we were to, to elevate that to the level of nations, it's, it's important that we, we need to look at the, the, wider, the, the bigger picture and looking at the well-being of all nations, of the, of the region as, as a whole. And then asking ourselves, what are, what are our responsibilities to, to achieving that? And, and I understand it's, it's difficult because nations, like people, are driven by national interest. And, and that's something that we, we all push for. I, I know it's a natural thing. But I think the context has changed. And we've come to a stage that we need to now balance out those, uh, those national interests, uh, in particular those immediate economic interests that we have. Uh, and, and looking at what is best for, 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 the, for the wider group. And, and this is why climate change brings that principle to the forefront. Because climate change is about taking cuts now to, to save, the, save everyone, actually, for that fact. So uh, if you look at it from that angle, then it is in the national interest of everyone to save our future and to save the future generation by taking action now. So I hope that in the future, uh, whatever the future holds for us, I think these principles and values uh, are very important to, to stabilizing the, the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> President Panawelu, some final reflections from you on our future leaders, please. Uh, thank you, Hartree. Uh, it is refreshing to hear the uh, perspectives of the you know, leaders who are here uh, among ourselves. Uh, it is, it is very important, I, I believe, thinking about all of this. I think there was a time in the past where if we don't do anything, uh, we are still okay. You know, as countries in the Pacific, the issues weren't so complex. I think growing up as a young child, uh, uh, Piyame put it very well, how important 
it is to be on the laps of your parent and then, you know, having the confidence that family is okay. Uh, we need not too much uh, to feel that our world is going to be okay and you have that uh, future that uh, you, you can feel that you have the confidence that it would be a, a better world for the future. Uh, for the uh, younger youth that uh, know the issues very well today, the challenge for us, uh, I think, leaders today, as we come together, uh, for me, the burden uh, is really to uh, prepare our future generation so that they are more fully aware, uh, probably more, more than ourselves here today, uh, to face those challenges that would, uh, you know, face our our nations. Uh, before I met uh, Kovi, I, I saw him on on the news media, uh, one of the conferences, uh, because of desperate measures, he, he was doing a press release standing in the ocean with the sign that he was holding because of, uh, so let's, uh, let's give him a, a round of applause. But the point, the point I'm trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, really put to you all who are young today is uh, uh, that you know, that you feel passionate about the issues uh, now uh, rather than later, uh, because you, we always say that your future is uh, mortgaged uh, more than uh, ours uh, as we have reached, uh, at, you know, our lifetimes today uh, growing up. I think uh, the, the world has a much bigger contrast if you look at it. Uh, where there were times in the past where maybe we, we thought that things are going to be okay and we don't need to do much. But if you look at what leaders are coming together today to, uh, uh, to address uh, advocacy on climate change, uh, just uh, uh, last year, if not earlier this year, last year and earlier this year, we had uh, King Dites that uh, we've never experienced in our lives and a couple of our highlands had to declare a, a state of emergency because uh, inundation of uh, salt water into uh, their food security that we have. And we've never dealt with those kind of issues in, in the past. And so I think the future generations that we as leaders must uh, prepare you uh, today while we want a better world for you in the future so that you don't have to uh, worry uh, uh, too much I think that the greatest challenge is that you be prepared to uh, you be prepared to uh, take on the succession of uh, pushing the issues that are important to our uh, shared Pacific community uh, to make sure that today, as I feel, most countries in the world are still uh, having that denial that climate change really does uh, uh, is happening uh, all around the world. But in fact, it is. It is happening, and I think technology that is showing us uh, how, how the world is changing. You just have to look at the uh, satellite imagery to see the uh, rapid melting of the uh, ice caps uh, you know, in the North Pole and South Pole to understand that 50 years from now, uh, the world will be very different from what we see today. And so I think being prepared for it and... Uh, you say that regionalism uh, all three is not something that happens and then we stop, but it's a continuity that all of you uh, younger people who are in school and who are concerned about our future, that you already start today because uh, our efforts are uh, collective. Uh, if we rely on just few countries to do the work for us, it's never going to be a, a better world for, for all of you. And that's why you can see today as Pacific Island countries, values that we advocate and our principles uh, are very important. Uh, but uh, the global community need, need to take on those actions so that we can keep the world uh, a better world for you in the future. Uh, even fighting for keeping the 1.5 uh, centigrade uh, to remain uh, uh, for the next 50 years is already a challenge. Uh, if you look at the obligations of countries under the Paris Agreement and the trajectory uh, as to where we will be 
uh, we're looking at even exceeding that 1.5 degree that we hope uh, to uh, maintain. Uh, and I, I, I will submit that it is because of the, probably the denial of the industrialized countries to really face on uh, the challenges that we have today. So we must work harder uh, together as a region to uh, push uh, this issue so that it becomes a, a global, global uh, uh, effort all together uh, doing it for a better world for, for all of you who are uh, young and the youth that we have out there in the Pacific. So that's my Thank point Thanks that I'd like much. to put Thank in. you very much. Thank you, President. And Prime Minister Matafa, any final comments from you? Um, I'd, I'd like to follow on from um, the, the, the comment made by um, Prime Minister Dern in terms of the thinking should be, you know, our region first, family, this family first. But it brings me, um, I suppose, to a reflection which is more about in the internal arrangements as opposed to getting our message externally. I mean, one of the key priorities of this meeting and leading up to this meeting is bringing the northern members of the family back. And, you know, their issues were they didn't feel included. And I think there was fair evidence. I was in New Zealand recently. I got interviewed by Moana TV, which is a Maori station. And the interviewer said to me, so you're going off to the forum meeting. Do you ever have times you know, where you're sitting, you know, the Pacific Islanders? and you're sort of looking over your shoulder at New Zealand and Australia as us versus them. That's another thing about this family. If we're going to be family, we have to be family all the way. And by, one, by way of demonstration, I, I would just like to say that Samoa has always taken the position that we didn't like uh, the arrangements where um, you, know, you had a Melanesian spearhead group. We had a small states group. And somehow the Polynesians felt like, OK, well, you know, if they're going to do it, we might as well do it as well. But we'd always felt, and this was premised, you know, once again, on the social construct that when you're family, you're family. Some are stronger, some are not as strong, but you all make the contribution. And we need to bring that premise to the Pacific family, if we're going to be really family. So that's really my what a, last What a great um... <laughs> Thank you very much, and, and uh, I, I think, Prime Minister, those are absolutely um, what I think the Forum family um, have a constancy to reflect on, and, and I thank you for, for sharing that. I really am going to apologise to the audience because I've just been told off by the MC that I've gone way over time. <coughs> so um, <coughs> I think you've been, it, it's been a really rich dialogue, uh, and you'll have appreciated very much the honesty and the frankness of the leaders that are here on, on, the, on the podium today. I will take one question, if I may, and um, uh, there are a f uh, Ashley, if there is a question, anywhere in the audience, just so that people leave knowing that the audience have been given an opportunity to ask <laughs> one question. Um, so thank you, and I can't see that far out, so. Thank you. All right, there is someone there. Thank you. Do introduce yourself. Do stand up so we can see you. Um, thank you. And so it's a young woman and she's youthful. Well done. <laughs> um, Malo and Talofa to everyone. Um, as a young indigenous woman and a Pacific Islander, 
I would like to ask the question to the leaders about deep sea mining and if there will be any, sorry, if there will be any um, initiatives and program with awareness and learning about, learning more about banning deep sea mining in the Pacific, knowing that the ocean is not just a life source for us, but is what connects us physically. Thank you. I, I'm, the deep sea mining question, can I, can I have a volunteer from, from the panel um, to deal with that issue? Um, thank you, President yeah. Penelope. I'll just briefly mm. say a little bit about it, but I know my colleagues have a deeper background on it. But the Pacific Ocean is our lives, you know, completely. Uh, growing up, I always say, uh, and then reaching the age that I am today, the, the, the fact that the Pacific is really connected to our land and our oceans uh, makes it all the more important that, uh, you know, the, the ocean is preserved. And we appreciate the question by the uh, young uh, lady. Uh, coming here, uh, we, some of us did not make it to the UN Oceans Conference, but I, I was following all of the leaders who were representing ourselves as a collective Pacific. Uh, some of them taking initiatives in, uh, you know, forming that alliance to uh, uh, sign on uh, with the countries that are initiating to uh, uh, put a moratorium on uh, seabed uh, uh, mining. And the uh, uh, reason being that while our ocean is so fast and so big, it, it serves, as all of us know, as a, a really big contribution in the sequestration of uh, carbon. And uh, we know that some countries are uh, racing maybe to look at the potential of finding uh, the type of uh, modules or minerals that can be extracted uh, from the deep sea for uh, purposes that can help our development. Uh, and so I thank uh, the president of Palau, uh, Fiji, and I believe Samoa, I didn't follow the rest of the countries, uh, maybe Vanuatu have joined that alliance uh, to put a moratorium on seabed mining. Uh, our country, through the uh, regional organizations who have helped us uh, develop a legal framework, uh, and we passed a, a, a law in our uh, Congress, which I was part of uh, while I was in Congress, uh, chairman of our Resources and Development Committee, uh, to begin uh, drafting laws, and we pass a very voluminous law that deals with creating the legal framework to, uh, uh, to look at uh, regulating our deep seabed. Uh, and so we don't know too much about this uh, seabed, but what we know is that if we begin to disturb it without really uh, m formulating the regulations with the International Seabed Authority and our individual sovereign nations, uh, then uh, we have the potential of uh, really uh, doing something very assertive to our, our uh, deep seabed. And so the, the group, as I know some of uh, our leaders can uh, go deeper into the background, I think the idea is to develop the, the regulatory framework so that we can require environmental uh, impact assessment to really tell us how impactful to the environment that would be before we even imagine uh, doing a seabed uh, uh, mining. And there are uh, numerous companies out there that are uh, probably ready to uh, come into the Pacific to uh, uh, look at the potential of extracting uh, the worth of our seabed. And so I hope I, uh, I've touched that. It's an area that uh, we're beginning to look into to make sure that uh, before we uh, think about doing any extraction of uh, uh, minerals from the seabed, uh, that we learn more about it uh, because ocean is uh, our lives. And we are still doing a whole lot of subsistence uh, uh, that we depend on our resources from our ocean. As a, uh, livelihood for our Pacific communities and uh, from our land, uh, the bounty of our ocean and our, our land. So I hope uh, on the service uh, uh, that's the, uh, the effort that uh, countries are doing uh, before we uh, imagine uh, about deep sea bed mining. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you.
And um, <clears throat> thank you very much, President Panawelu. Um, and if I may just indulge uh, everyone just a few more minutes and thank you leaders for taking a few more minutes I did tell the MC that we did start late so I wanted to not lose the the extra time that was owed me um, but I would like to now invite um, another Pacific leader to join us uh, on the podium Reverend James Bhagwan Padre I can't see you but I, there you are um, and you know just to take a few moments Padre if you don't mind to reflect back um, what you've heard in this Talanoa maybe share some key insights uh, and to offer a, summon a summation of this discussion um, so thank you very much for that and for, for being so patient with us thank you Audrey and you put me at a pulpit I will not preach for three hours don't worry I looked at that picture and I heard so much about age and men, I'm glad I shaved today. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, even though I'm a, a mature minister, I'm still so seen as the young boy in the church when I meet the older ministers, so I'm the carry boy. But I, if we reflect on what we've heard today, and I want to start right at the beginning because we began with the leadership of indigenous people. That wasn't just an item that was performed, that was indigenous people speaking the language of indigenous people in dance through culture. And we have to recognize that as Pacific people, we don't just speak one language. We speak the language, yes, of policy, we speak political language, but we speak the language of culture, the language of spirituality, the language of tradition, which is what guides us. And today we have had, in the reflections that we've heard, different aspects of that language spoken. What we've also heard is the role that activism plays in shaping our leaders, particularly our young activists, many whom sit on the stage began as young activists, as we heard. And I am reminded, uh, from my YWCA connections that uh, the Honorable Prime Minister of Samoa was also a young woman, YWCA world member, council member at one stage as well. So there are many different ways in which our young people can get involved in leadership. I also want to acknowledge that when we talk about leadership, and, and perhaps I'm not the right person to talk about women in leadership, although I come from a feminist family, um, I acknowledge a, a look that our two women prime ministers gave each other when that was mentioned by Audrey. But in that look, another language, a, 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 a non-verbal language, and I just saw, and that communicated so much about the shared challenges and the shared journeys that they must have gone through, and, and they reflected on that as, um, as they shared their stories today. But in the context of who we are as Pacific people, the reminder that regionalism is part of our identity. We are community, we are Pacific family. It is not an either or, it is an and, both local and regional. The role of traditional leadership, the role of our culture and our values as responsibilities, as custodians that we need to manage, as guardians of our Blue Pacific. As someone who works predominantly these days with civil society, I want to acknowledge that we have so many women in our civil society leadership today. And I wish and I pray that that translates, as we've heard, into the political sphere because our leaders are being nurtured there. And maybe they will, be, they will have that opportunity to come forward. The Pacific Churches this year had as our representatives to the first uh, member state parties of the uh, TPNW in Vienna and the Oceans Conference were not represented by the old padres but by two young women, young mothers, taking the stories of their Pacific to go and advocate. Of course, they were accompanied by a slightly older archbishop, but they worked together. So the intergenerational aspect of leadership is also very important. And I'll plead to our leaders of those who have faced the challenge both 
in terms of being women leaders, but also young leaders coming through, is to mentor the future leaders of our Pacific, to make that space open and invite them to come forward. The question of leadership and regionalism as you prepare, dear leaders, for your retreat tomorrow is something that we have been reflecting on and how I wish that this Talanoa was the dialogue we had with civil society and private sector earlier today. But you mentioned some really important things about being anchored, about being rooted. And I would like to conclude this reflection by sharing something that our civil society groups reflected on, leadership, on what it means to be Pacific, what it means to be part of the family. And it is a covenant that they put together, and it begins with two words. We are. We are because we have been. We are because we are to be. In solidarity we come. We in turn renew our commitment to build solidarity, recognizing the preponderance of reasons that unite us and that our weaves are made stronger by the weave of the other. In solidarity, we come as Pacific people who are custodians of nature, anchored by our faith and our spirituality. Yet we come as we are because together we hold a vital responsibility. The mantle has been passed on to us by our ancestors from their hands into our hands. If you are interested, I can share you with that covenant later. But that is just the introduction to a covenant that civil society have pledged to work together. And it is our hope and our dream that not only with the 2050 strategy, but as you meet tomorrow to discuss and reflect on the future of our regionalism, that it is something that you come out saying, we are. May God bless you all. Naka. The Nakavakalevu Padre for really that very thoughtful and deep reflection and for capturing so many of those important insights and moments. I thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have well and truly gone over our time um, and I have uh, and really indulged the, the, the time of the leaders who have got a program this evening. So I thank our leaders most sincerely. Uh, and I thank you, audience, as well. And I will hand over now to the Master of Ceremonies. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. We have two more things to do. And the first thing is to watch a video for your viewing pleasure. Thank you. As people of the Blue Pacific, we have great strengths, but we continue to face serious challenges, including climate change, COVID-19, poverty, and a lack of quality education and healthcare. Changes brought by the global pandemic and climate emergency test our resilience every day. The silver lining is that they also reveal the power of Pacific cooperation. We are meeting these challenges, the 18 members of the Pacific Islands Forum, alongside the Council of Regional Organizations, have worked with communities to develop the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent. The heart of the strategy is to work together as one region, so we can embrace our strengths and shape our own future. In July 2020, member countries identified key areas to address. The work focused on developing the region's vision for 2050, recognizing what is driving change and determining collective responses. Despite the arrival of COVID-19, our 18 countries and their partners continued work, and the next part of the process developed clear pathways towards 2050. Now, ready for leaders' consideration, 
the strategy will act as the guiding star for the Pacific. We are the captain. We are the ones who must make the day-to-day -day decisions that lead us to our destination. With the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific continent in place, we can work together as one united region, strive to protect our vast island resources, and respect and defend the rights of our people. And I believe, despite the incredible challenges before us, it is our people who can emerge as the country's most powerful drivers of change. Join us. And the final thing we have to do is to thank the panelists for an inspirational and thought-provoking uh, end to this Kalano series of public lectures. So it would, it would be remiss of us not to show our appreciation and tear the roof off this auditorium by the usual manner. <laughs>